I'm going to talk to you today about the vote for Donald Trump. Uh, I entitled this talk, Some of My Best Friends Were Republicans. It would appear that in the face of all of the unappetizing facts that have come out about the way candidate Donald Trump thinks and acts, more than a third of American voters are going to give this gentleman their vote. Last time I looked, it was upwards of 47%. This knowledge has evoked in me a great variety of thoughts and feelings, but none as commanding as simple perplexity. I must admit, I just don't get it. So I here put to those many hundreds of thousands of Trump supporters, tell me, please, what is it you find most attractive about Donald Trump? Is it his oft-expressed contempt for women? especially if they're not young and beautiful? Is it perhaps his contempt for people of color? His contempt for the truth? Barack Obama was not born in the United States. Or I can't reveal my taxes because my lawyer told me it's under orders. Is it his contempt for science? Climate change is a hoax. Is it his contempt for basic moral decency in the laws of the land? And I quote, as a celebrity, I can grope women's genitals, and they can't do very much about it. He's right there. Bill Cosby's been getting away with it for 50 years. So maybe that's something Donald's telling us the truth about. Well, maybe it's his contempt for American democracy. And I quote, our, our electoral system is corrupt, riddled with fraud, should be done away with. Uh, he's speaking, of course, of the presidential vote on Tuesday, and uh, uh, it's just not to be believed unless, of course, he wins, in which case it's the voice of the people. Perhaps it's Trump's breathtaking consistencies that you admire, as the polls whose results he trumpeted when they flattered him, he now condemns as rigged against him, as they document his fall from grace. Perhaps your support isn't political at all. Perhaps it's one of sympathy. You may be one of those compassionate conservatives, and you feel badly for Donald, given the weight and number of his deficiencies, his threadbare intellect, his imitation of masculinity, his fragile self-esteem. Perhaps you see him as a paragon of self-awareness, and thus take at face value his assertions that I'm the world's greatest businessman. Well, to accept that, like Donald, you'd have to be amnesic for those bankruptcies. Or his claim to be a great lover. And again, you would have to confuse groping for foreplay and sexual assault for seduction. Perhaps you find his paranoia exhilarating when he now turns on the press. That same enterprise which gave him a free ride to the nomination he didn't have to spend a penny of his own money. The press gave him all sorts of publicity, and he loved it. Now, on the other hand, as the press begins to document some of the unsavory things that have come out against him, he rails against the press as being biased. And that, by the way, even includes those pinko left-wingers on the Wall Street Journal and the National Review, and especially Fox News. You can't believe them anymore. They're just biased against me. They've got it in for me. Perhaps you're impressed with the diplomatic way he responds to criticisms, not with better facts or reasoned rebuttals, but with personal attacks on the critics. Perhaps you're fascinated with how Trump comes alive when he goes to war, how he seems to be at his best when he's engaged in a frontal assault. That seems to be the basis of his campaign, attacking people. His attacks on his enemies now exhausted, he's taken to annihilating his friends. You know, he's already uh, slashed all the Democrats, all the liberals, uh, the uh, liberal media. Uh, there's hardly anybody left except Republicans. He's taking them on now. Uh, remember what he did during the debates. Uh, this candidate was ugly. Would you really want that ugly face in the White House? 
Well, Bush, he has no energy. And this fellow's too short. This fellow's father was engaged in the assassination of Kennedy. Well, it doesn't matter that they were once allies. Speaker of the House, Ryan, bad news, he's out. Uh, Senator McCain, uh, that's not a war hero. Uh, there's hardly anyone uh, that isn't a suitable target for Donald Trump. He's got, I just think, two allies left, uh, mayor, former Mayor uh, Giuliani and Chris Christie. But you notice in the photographs, they always stand behind him. I don't think they want to get in front of him and get into his line of sight. I'll tell you, fellas, your time will come. Perhaps you admire his statesmanlike approach to other nations, the diplomatic way he words his criticisms, the good humor and grace with which he receives criticisms directed at him. Maybe you're taken by his diplomatic skills, how he responds to criticisms, not by reasonable responses, but instead goes with insults and slander. It's so much easier to attack somebody's personality or their appearance than to listen to what they're saying and see whether or not perhaps their criticism has some merit. There are so many characteristics uh, that stand out, it's hard for me to know which of these you find most compelling. It may well be that you don't like Donald Trump at all, that you find his lasciviousness, his sexual predations, uh, his so-called family values repellent. Uh, it puzzles me that parts of the United States which I thought venerated family values. We used to call those states the Bible Belt, now we call them the family values states. They're very supportive of Donald, despite his three marriages and divorces, his confession that he committed adultery even while he was married, his pronouncements of his daughter's breasts as being voluptuous and his agreeing with Howard Stern that she is a piece of ass. Well, if these are your family values, then my friends and Trump loyalists, your family values are very different from mine. Well then, perhaps it isn't Donald at all. His personality, his characteristics, that's not why you're supporting him. It's his policies, that he is a standard bearer for the conservatives and you can rely upon him, therefore, to do what's right for this country. Well, let's take a look at some of uh, Mr. Trump's uh, most celebrated pronouncements on those rare occasions when he puts aside his criticisms and his slander of people and actually begins to talk about the issues. One of the things that he's very strong for is the Second Amendment. And he will fight to the death anyone who will challenge your right to bear arms. Uh, well, the Second Amendment talks about access to a weapon as part of a militia. And if you are a strict originist, which means that you interpret the Constitution by getting inside the minds of the people who actually wrote the Constitution rather than any modifications because of new issues today, if you look at what the world was like when the Second Amendment was written and why it's in there. We had just recently, this country, freed ourselves from George III. And there was great concern that a strong chief executive might have kingly aspirations. And uh, if, let's say, a president decided after four or eight years uh, he wanted to stay a little longer, it was important that the citizens be in a position to move him on out. And thus, in order to do that, they would have access to a militia uh, in the states that could go to Washington and make sure that Washington was not becoming a monarchy. That's the purpose of the Second Amendment. And it was written at a time when the weapon in mind was a musket. That's the weapons that prevailed during the time of the writing of the Second Amendment. 
Now, a musket is lethal at 100 yards. It can do some damage at 150 yards, and that's about it. It also takes about a minute to load. So you've got to get your target on the first shot. If you miss him on the first shot, he can cover those 150 yards and get to you before you reload. And if it's raining, forget about it. The powder will not fire. That's the weapon they had in mind. They never conceived of rifles that were lethal at three and four miles uh, or um, automatic weapons that can fire 100, 200, 300 rounds in a second. This was not in their minds. So I, too, support the Second Amendment if everybody would turn in their weapons and get them replaced with a musket. I would feel very safe about that. But not Mr. Trump. Mr. Trump's solution to gun violence in this country is more guns. Everybody should be carrying. So we can have shootouts in the churches and in the schools and in the Safeways. Well, it, you know, it has a certain Old West appeal to it. The trouble is that when a good guy engages in a shootout with a bad guy, the good guy always loses. Not in the movies, but in real life. The bad guy is going to have the drop on the good guy. Why? Well, he's a bad guy. He doesn't care about human life. And he sees a homeowner with a gun. He's pointing it at him. He's going to shoot him and kill him. The homeowner's never killed anybody. Never broken the law before. He's got a lethal weapon in his hand. And he's going to hesitate for a few seconds. And those few seconds will prove lethal. So in a battle between a bad guy and a good guy, I'm afraid the good guy in real life is going to lose. But, you know, it isn't uh, defending one's home. It isn't violence coming from outlaws. Uh, it's violence coming from ordinary law-abiding citizens that is causing this horrendous death due to gun violence. And it's growing. These are people who have never broken the law until that fatal day when they do inadvertently kill someone. How does this happen? Well, if you have guns everywhere, they tend to get used. Most of the homicides that take place in your home are not brought into that home by a prowler. Most people who get killed in their home die because of a gun that was in the night table drawer. The husband is angry and drunk and shoots his wife. A six-year-old boy is playing with a gun and he shoots his three-year-old kid. Uh, or the wife is suicidal, and she finds a gun, blows herself away. There used to be a, a slogan, a bumper sticker, if guns are outlawed, only outlaws will have guns. Well, actually, that would be a good thing, because only 10% of the homicides, the gun homicides in this country, are the result of shoots by outlaws. And usually when they shoot, they kill another outlaw. 90% of the homicides in this country come from law-abiding citizens in under unusual circumstances or unusual stresses. We also have a horrendous suicide rate in this country. Now, it's very hard to commit suicide, believe it or not. Uh, people go to the bridge and they look down at the water and it's too far to jump. They, they back off. They take a bottle of pills. And more often than not, the pills make them sick. They throw up. doesn't kill them. Um, turn on the oven, don't light it, just let the gas fill the kitchen. Upstairs, neighbor smells something, comes down, saves them. Most suicides are attempted and fail. And when a suicide attempt fails, the person is so grateful. Uh, it changes their life, and for three, four, five years, they're okay. They don't do it again, unless the suicide weapon is a gun. Taking your own life is an impulsive moment. A person could be depressed for weeks and months, but they have the impulse, I've had it, I'm going to kill myself. And if that decision occurs in the presence of a gun, they don't have that grace period you have with pills uh, or the gas in the oven. It's almost always lethal. I just wish you would come down to the emergency room of the hospital where I've worked and see the results on Saturday night of gun violence. And we've been talking about homicides. There are a lot of people who aren't killed, but they wish they were 
because of the tremendous injuries they've suffered. And I'm talking about kids and, and innocent women. Uh, th this is not the result of outlaws. It's the result of you and me and guns. We have too many guns, and that's why we have the homicide rate we have. But Trump, as far as he's concerned, the more guns, the merrier. He's also attacked the uh, Affordable Health Care Act, that Obamacare is a mess, it's uh, just expensive, it doesn't do any good, we've got to do away with it. And we've been hearing this for several years now from the Republicans. Every week, the House of Representatives would take a vote uh, abolishing Obamacare, which of course he would veto. Uh, we, we've been hearing about what a terrible thing this is, um, and it's gone on and on. The verbiage that has been devoted to this health care issue in this country is astonishing. The trees that have been cut down to provide the paper on which all these essays excoriating this government-sponsored health plan. And of all the things that I've heard, both at the nominating convention, during the sessions of Congress, and during Donald Trump's speeches about health care, when Republicans talk about health care, it's interesting. There are two words you will never hear. Never hear them. Sick people. All this talk about health care, they never mention sick people. A lot of folks lost their homes five or six years ago because of that mortgage catastrophe. But just as many lose their homes every year because the breadwinner took ill. We're the only Western democracy that didn't have a national health insurance until we finally got Obamacare. Now, it is imperfect. It's lumpy, it's uneven, it's probably too expensive. Most of the problems with it uh, were included in order to get a few Republican votes to get it to pass. The best thing would have simply been to extend Medicare. Medicare is a wonderful government health plan. 94 cents out of every dollar expended by Medicare goes to direct care of the sick person. Only six cents out of the dollar goes to administrative costs. All we have to do is expand Medicare for everybody. Maybe not all at once. First year, uh, you become eligible at age 60 instead of 65. Next year, you become eligible at age 55 and on down until everybody's covered. You do it gradually so there are no shocks to the system. Republicans wouldn't have it. Now, what about the insurance companies? We've got to take care of them. So we've got these insurance companies and these elaborate systems just to pick up those few conservative votes to get something passed. Most of the Republicans fought a tooth and a nail just as they fought Medicare, just as they fought Social Security, just about anything worthwhile it's interesting, the conservatives seem to have to fight them. So we make do with what we have, but Republicans still will tell you what a terrible thing it is for a government-sponsored health plan. Uh, all the legislatures, the Republican House of Representatives, the senators, this is a terrible thing, government plans. What they don't tell you is that they have a cradle to the grave government health plan. They and their whole families, even if they're only in Congress for two years, they get this policy and it continues after they leave office. They have no expenses, no dental problems. They get their free glasses, their hearing aids, all free, all a government program for the congressmen. They have voted that for themselves. So apparently they do like government health plans. They just don't want you to have one. That's the program that Donald Trump is in favor of. All right, perhaps uh, you're not enamored of Donald Trump's personality. You're not really that crazy about his platform, but you hate Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. Well, again, you know, I find myself perplexed uh, you know, I certainly don't agree with everything that Obama uh, has done or what Hillary proposes. Uh, in the case of Barack Obama, uh, I think he sold 
our openness to uh, trade, negotiations, and freedom of borders with Cuba. I think he, he sold that uh, much too cheaply. I don't think we got anything for it. Uh, I think it would have been wise for him to demand that they release all their dissenters from prison and have absolute free press. Any kind of radio or newspapers or magazines, doesn't matter what their point of view, uh, they should be uh, given the same freedom they enjoy in this country and make Cuba do that for six months. And if they keep their end of the bargain, then perhaps uh, we'll give them what they want, which is the free passage between their island and this country. So I think he gave that away too cheaply. Um, but, but to hate, to hate Barack Obama, he's a mild-mannered gentleman. He's a family man. He's no vices. Quit smoking for his uh, daughter and his, his, his wife's sake. Uh, hard to get a harsh word out of the man. Uh, I can see disagreeing with some of his policies, but to hate him? Don't get it. And then there's a hatred of, of Hillary. Um, now, <laughs> I will agree, uh, we're not going to see her uh, going through stop signs and running red lights in her haste to rush to admit a mistake. Uh, that's not part of her DNA. That's one thing I think she shares with Donald Trump. It's hard for her to admit error. And she's a little too hawkish you know, for, for my taste. I think the military option is still on the table when she confronts the problems we're having in the Middle East. And that's disturbing to me because I don't think the military option works. Every time uh, we deploy a wonderful American World War II uh, assault on, on these bad guys, we have a day or two of glory and then it bites us in the ass for the next uh, 20 years. I don't know if Hillary appreciates that when you eliminate the tyrant, whether it's Gaddafi or Saddam, what you get is not democracy. What you get is chaos. It makes the situation worse. I don't know what the solution is in the Middle East. I do know that the military solution to try and solve a socioeconomic and political or personality problem is doomed to fail. I've heard that if you take two Muhyiddin freedom fighters somewhere, anywhere from the Middle East, and lock him in a room for 24 hours. When they come out, you'll find they have split into three factions. Now, we just can't deal in a reasonable way with them as we might with our European counterparts. But putting that aside, to hate Hillary, for the last 14 months, I've heard about her emails. That this is a terrible thing, her server, her emails, her emails, her server. And I keep waiting, where is this going? Where's the, where's the payoff? Where what she has done is going to affect me and my country in a terrible way. That uh, we're going to find out that um, uh, she's been giving away the secrets to the maniac who runs North Korea, that she's giggling of treason, or that she's really... Chinese mole. She had plastic surgery, so it doesn't look Chinese, but she's in the, the pockets of uh, Beijing. Uh, or maybe just that she's got 35 unpaid parking tickets, or she's got a book out from the library. It's three years overdue, or she's missed three payments on her Walmart Visa card. Anything in these emails that's going to make me think, my God, what a terrible woman. She's a criminal. But I keep hearing email, server, server email, nothing. No smoking gun. You know, I'd settle for a cap pistol. We get nothing. That's, again, Donald Trump's campaign, attacking her emails. I understand that um, she had some doubts about the security of using a government server. Uh, and whereas, you know, I hear she has a few bucks. She could afford a private server that would be more secure and what the government provides. And there's, I think, reason to that. Uh, you send a, an email from the State Department to uh, uh, the White House, and by the time the president has got it open, Putin's already read his copy. So she has another way of doing it. 
Uh, and you can work at home. I can understand if you're working, you know, 12 hours a day, seven days a week in the office. You want to take your work home with you. Maybe it was a mistake. Maybe she broke some rules. But that's why we have to attack her. That's why we hate her. Uh, again, I, 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 just, I just don't get it. I've discussed with you today the personality traits which caused me to wonder how, as more and more of what we have learned about Trump comes out, so many people continue to support him. They support him even if he attacks them or attacks their family. They apparently will support him even when his family values uh, are so inimical to their own. They support him uh, even when he seems incapable of distinguishing falsehood from truth. You know, he, he talks about Hillary being a liar. Well, you know, she said some things that are untrue or half true. He's a politician. That's what, that's what they do. Everything that Donald Trump says is a lie, and I'm including the and is and he, you can't, you simply can't believe it. Um, he told us that uh, he can't release his tax returns. His lawyer said he's, uh, he's taking an order. He can't release them. Well, it turns out he couldn't release them because if he did, we would find out, well, of course, truth always outs, that he hasn't paid any taxes for years. So those of you who support Donald Trump, maybe you're just extraordinarily generous. You're compassionate and you're willing to pay Donald's taxes for him. If he doesn't pay his fair share, who's going to pick up the tab? You are. Now, Donald Trump, he enjoys the security that a strong and expensive military provides. He breathes our environmentally protected air. He drinks our environmentally protected water. He uses our roads and our bridges. Uh, he employs educated men, most of whom got their education free. By free, I mean uh, the government paid for their education up through high school. He benefits from that. But he just doesn't want to pay for it. And he didn't want you to know that. It's expensive running this country. We've got a lot of obligations. Uh, now, Trump being a Republican, supposedly, is supposed to be frugal. I've heard since I was a little child the difference between Democrats and Republicans. Democrats spend and spend, and Republicans are frugal. But if you look at the economic record, you find that Republicans spend as much of your money, whether they are in the House or in the Senate, as the Democrats do. They have all their programs and expensive things that they want. The only difference between the Republicans and the Democrats, Republicans don't want to pay for it. At least the Democrats say, you know, we've got to raise taxes to pay for these things. Republicans say, no taxes. Donald Trump's going to cut your taxes. He cuts your taxes. Who's going to pay for the government? Well, uh, <laughs> we add to the debt. Uh, I've always wondered why wealthy people aren't Democrats. They tend to be Republican. And yet, if you look at 100 years of American economy, we always do better on the Democrats. Now, Republicans are associated with terrible crashes, whether it's the one we had in, in 09 or 1929. Under Democrats, we do well. We have budget surpluses. Now, Bill Clinton left Bush with billions of dollars of surplus. Bush went through it like butter in three months. Barack Obama has dug us out of the hole. Uh, maybe we're not totally out yet, but we're doing pretty well. And would it surprise you to know that the stock market always does much better in Democratic administrations than under Republicans. So again, I, I don't get it if you just are focusing on your pocketbook and don't care about his personality. Your pocketbook alone would say we need not only a, a Democrat in the White House, but we've got to go down the ticket and make sure that the House of Representatives and the Senate become Democratic again. So there are all sorts of conundrums that I just, 
I, I just can't figure it out. And I worry. I worry to see my country move in that direction. And so many people don't see the folly and the danger of a Donald Trump. I mean, he is a man who attacks immigrants, he attacks the press, and he does a very good job of it. And he has no power. Imagine what this man could do with his animosities if he had power. In living memory, there was a man who rose to popularity and power, riding a platform which, as a devoted Trump loyalist, you will doubtless find familiar. Excoriation of whole groups of his countrymen simply on the grounds of their race and religion. His contempt for his country's democratic values and a determination to replace them with one-man rule. His condemnation and banning of the press unless it towed his party line. His promises to put his political opponents behind bars. If this is the kind of man you want as your leader, then I must report to you that the 1930s have come and gone. You are living in the wrong time. Perhaps you're living in the wrong country. I thank you for your time and your attention.